it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Good morning, Blue Ridge. Good morning. I like that. That's for I like that for an intro like me. It feels pretty. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm messing with my pack. I have to talk to the technical director about that. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I, I serve as the technical director here, but I also serve as one of the elders uh, here at Blue Ridge, and I'm excited that I get to be with you this morning uh, here in New London and in Bedford and online. Uh, you know, if you've been a part of Blue Ridge over the past several months, then you know that we desire as a church to be the kind of church where we see disciples making disciples. Um, that is that if we're a follower of Jesus, that we're actively involved in helping others someone else followed Jesus between Sundays. And undoubtedly, you've heard something about dreams and visions, um, which is that we believe that God's future for our church will largely be informed through Acts 2.17, that God will be pouring out his spirit on us as a church, will be giving us dream, uh, dreams and visions of ways that we can go live missional lives outside of these walls. Um, and that these dreams and visions won't just come from one or two people that you see teaching from stage week after week, but from the collective whole of us as a community. Because here, here's the conviction. And you guys can go look up all kinds of research and data on this, Lifeway Research, Pew uh, Research, um, Life, uh, uh, Barna Group. But the world is changing, our culture is changing. And the people that we want to reach with the good news of Jesus, the hope and the love of Jesus, statistically speaking, just are not likely to show up to this building, to this room on a Sunday morning for a service like this. And so it is imperative for us as Christ followers as, uh, to go and live on mission outside of these walls, to be a meaningful expression of Jesus to the people in our life, in our community, the people that we work with. And we know that there are questions about this whole dreams and visions thing. We know, you know, we've heard, you know, I hear what you guys are saying, but I'm just not quite following what you're saying. Or maybe I'm having dreams and visions, but how do I know if it's really from God or not? So every several weeks, what we're wanting to do is to push pause on our teaching series to try to paint a picture for how we see God leading us, where we think he's leading us, to ho hopefully bring that more into focus and to share with you stories um, that are already working in our community. A couple weeks ago, we had a group of people um, on stage who were having dreams and visions uh, for, to reach the people in their community in the Appomattox Concord area, a burden to reach those people. And as they prayed about it, as they sought God's direction, um, and he kept revealing to them the next steps, it, it eventuated into the form of a church plant. But we know that not all dreams and visions look the same. They're not all going to be church plants, although we would love to see God plant more churches out of this community. And so this morning, Steve Foster, our newest elder, he and I are gonna be talking with some people in our community who are having similar dreams and visions, uh, similar burdens to reach people, uh, only it's resulted into the form of a, of a nonprofit organization. And so what does this mean for us this morning? Well, if you're, here, if you're a follower of Jesus, I would, if you would ask, be willing to ask God, God, what is the dream or vision that you have for my life? How can I, how can, how do you want to use me outside of these walls to be a meaningful expression of Christ to the people in my life, to the people that I work with, that I'm in community with, the, my neighbors, wherever it is. And so would you be willing to pray that with me as I pray? Let's pray together. God, I, I do pray. The thing that, that comes back in my mind you know, out of Acts 2.17 is that I will pour out my spirit. And that's what we're asking you to do. God, we know that despite our best planning, we can come up with ideas, lots and lots of ideas. But we want to be driven and we want it to be fueled by your spirit. And so, Father, for the ones maybe that are here listening to me today that are asking you for the first time, 
for you to give them a dream or a vision, I pray that you would. I pray that you would make it clear to them how you want them to live missionally outside of these walls. I pray that as we hear the stories uh, from our groups, from our folks today, that as they share them, as we listen to these, Father, maybe for some, you, you will affirm a next step. But Father, we, we ask you and invite your spirit to move. Would you lead us? And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Well, would you welcome our guests to the stage this morning? <clears throat> All right, well, good morning, New London. Good morning. Wow. <laughs> good morning, Bedford. And good morning to those of you who are online watching. Uh, we're so glad that everybody is here joining us. So this morning, uh, we have Harley and Carla Powell. And um, you became part of Blue Ridge about a year ago when we were meeting in the parking lot at Bedford and um, you had this vision, this dream uh, about what God was calling you to do. And so Carla, why don't you share with, with us what that dream was and how that's being lived out today. So yeah, my name is Carla Powell and I'm with Anxious for Nothing. So when uh, COVID took place, it allowed me a lot of opportunity to make room for God and the Holy Spirit. And I started seeking and asking God, what do you want me to do in this season? And God gave me a vision and during a prayer time of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And that was it. And I was like, okay, well, I don't think you want me to eat them. So you obviously want me to take them somewhere and maybe serve them, but, but where? So I continued to pray about it, and then a few days later, I had a dream that um, I was at a place uh, that I thought was apartments, and it had a whole bunch of windows, and a lot of people were outside, and there was just this fire in the corner, and then a pair of yellow flip-flops on the ground. And so the next day, I wake up, and I tell my sister, I said, I think Sunday, we're going to go hand out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but I'm not really sure where at. And she said, well, I know the perfect place. There's um, a hotel and it's full of people struggling with addiction and homelessness and mental health that just really feel hopeless. And they don't have anything there. She's like, they don't have towels, they don't have soap. She said, they don't even have a pair of flip-flops. And I knew then that's where we were to go. So that Sunday, we loaded up our truck, we took 26 sandwiches and 10 hygiene bags and we pulled into the hotel parking lot and we dropped our tailgate and we just hollered out at all the people and said, hey, we have lunch and they started to come down. And from there, uh, God's continued to work in our life and provided an image of a skate park and a ministry. So from that, we started going to the skate park and doing pretty much the same thing, except teaching kids how to skateboard and asking them if they want prayer. And I was like, God, how do these two things even go together? Like I'm in one location here and we're in another location there. And then what I was seeing is the kids that were at the skate park ministry was helping us make the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that we were taking to these locations. So it became a discipleship. And then I seen God's plan, how it was all supposed to work together. Yeah, for sure. So Harley, uh, tell us what's the significance of the hotels in Roanoke for you? Um, going to Roanoke to, uh, to these hotels really hits home with me because uh, you know, um, me and my mother, we actually lived at one of the hotels for a summer that, uh, that we go serve at. And, um, you know, and, and just going there and seeing the people who struggle with drug addiction and uh, uh, mental health and alcoholism. And, uh, you know, I, I've struggled through my own battle of that. And uh, so it, it really hits at home me to be able to go there and uh, just see these people standing out on these balconies just, just looking for something, you know, and they, they can't find it in alcohol or drugs, and they just don't know what they're doing, and uh, they're just so lost and confused, so uh, it, it really hits home at me because, you know, I, I've, been, I've been on the other end of that, and, uh, you know, when we first pulled up at the hotel in Roanoke, and it's like three stories, and the people are standing out front, and they're leaning over the handrail, and it's like they're just looking for something, and, uh, you know, and so just be able to go there and just uh, to deliver hope and let them know that, uh, you know, that God will pull all that from them. Um, you know, you just have to surrender to his will. Uh, it, it's just, it, it really done just so much. And the relationships and stuff that we have built there, and to just see these people start to, uh, 
uh, start to look for something different. And uh, it's been really amazing. And, um, you know, I, I, just by the grace of God, am I not on the other end of this ministry, you know? By the grace of God, am I not leaning over a handrail in Roanoke at a hotel full of uh, you just not, not good stuff and uh, uh, wishing somebody would come feed me, you know? So I, I, just, I just want to let all of them know that, you know, um, that there is hope and it's not lost. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's what we do there. Yeah, so... <clears throat> For about the last year, I've been going with Carla and Harley to Roanoke. And day one, they were just hotels. I had no idea about what was really going on in these hotels. And so it's, it just opened my eyes and exposed me to a whole nother world where this is where the least of these are living and doing life. And we're just, we're coming to them, we're bringing the gospel to them. So Carla, explain how has Blue Ridge kind of partnered with you? What does that look like? So yes, I've been at Blue Ridge for almost a year now and it's, it's been amazing. And again, it was a dream that brought me to Blue Ridge. I had a dream. God told me to go to Blue Ridge. I was at another church and I was like, are you sure God? Really? But I did. And now we see why they have been so amazing. And this is now our church. And Blue Ridge partners with us every Sunday in Bedford. Um, we actually have a team, our Hope Dealers in Bedford. I want to say hi. We appreciate and love you guys. We couldn't do it without you. We have a team that is in there every Sunday helping us make 150 to 170 lunches. We also have um, tubs that are set out in the atrium that has um, just where you can put in canned food, hygiene items, deodorant, and stuff that we can also bring to the hotels. Um, and recently, Blue Ridge has allowed us to use their old Gorman space uh, that they have, they've, they've been blessed with, and they've blessed us to use it on Friday nights for youth prayer and pizza. So we meet every Friday night. We teach kids how to skateboard. We play games. And most importantly, we pray about what's going on in their lives. And we do a devotional and we have a worship time. And so Blue Ridge has went along in so many different aspects of this. So share with us a story, something that has happened where you've seen God work in somebody's life. Okay, I'm going to have Harley share that story. Um... Yeah, we, uh, we make the bag lunches and we staple scripture to each bag of lunch. And uh, we were at Roanoke and um, everybody comes out to the car and uh, we hand out the lunches and we ask, how are you doing? Is there anything we can help you with? Uh, do you need prayer for anything? And um, there, there was this one in particular guy that come out and, you know, he's, he's, he's not, you know, he's looking at me like, no, no, I don't need no prayer. You know, he gets his lunch and he just walks off. And uh, I didn't think nothing about it. I keep doing what I'm doing. And like five minutes later, he comes back to me just bawling, just crying. And uh, he, he comes up and he puts his head in my chest. And he's like, I read the scripture. And uh, God, God told me to come back. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> here, I, here I am standing in this parking lot at a hotel with this grown man and his chest in my his head in my chest and he's, and he's crying. I mean, I'm not talking about just a tear. I mean, he's bawling, crying. And uh, so I just, I just embrace him and uh, I start to pray and I pray for, you know, uh, comfort and strength and guidance. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I could tell, you know, um, and, and just I, it's, the things that happen at these hotels, there's so many stories that I could tell. This is just one of many of them. And the experience and the things that continue to happen there is, uh, it's no mistake that God has us there for a reason. You know, he's led us to these places to, uh, to deliver hope and show people that they're, you know, uh, that hope isn't lost. And, uh, but yeah, and I, I tell you, and the, the, it just keeps growing. And it's just so amazing to see uh, God's plan unfold and to see these people. Uh, that particular guy, like I didn't see him the next week and it was a couple weeks later. We see him, he comes back to the hotel and he's got like work boots on and a vest and he's got a shirt that says something about Jesus on it. And uh, I'm like, how are you doing? And he's like, I got a job, man. He's like, I'm getting back on my feet. And I'm like, do you need? He's like, yeah, I will take another one of those lunches. You know, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's just amazing to watch God's plan unfold. So hold on to that mic, yeah. So I don't know if you realize this, but we have an ark, and I don't know if you've seen it, but out back, you'll, you can't miss it. So Harley, tell us about, there's a picture of it. Tell us about the ark. Uh, yeah, the, 
I, I kind of growed up skateboarding. Um, we got run off from everywhere we ever went. We didn't have cool ramps and stuff like that. We skated on uh, anywhere there was a flat surface. Uh, so a little over a year ago, me and my son, we started skateboarding uh, at this skate park in Bedford, and uh, it was just, it was just brought it all back out for me. And uh, we'd watch the sun go down at the skate park. We shut it down like every day for, I know, at least a month. And uh, um, so COVID hit, they shut the park down, and me and my son was like, what are we gonna do now? And uh, so I built like some little makeshift ramps at the house, and we played on those. And uh, um, then God gives me the vision of uh, uh, building a bigger ramp that's mobile that I could take places. And I set up mobile homes. And uh, so I have a truck and I had this big frame and I told my wife what I'm gonna do. And she's like, yeah, okay. And then I pull it out and we get to working on it. And she's like, that's, that's huge. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, uh, it's a vision that God had given me. And everybody's asking me like, do you have a blueprint or God or how you? And I'm like, I, I got a picture in my head <laughs> of what I want. And then everybody's like, Are, it's gonna be really big. I'm like, yeah, yeah. and I, as I'm building it, like, uh, I, I would go home at night and I would sit there and I like, I could not stop thinking about it. Like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do next. It seemed like we would work a half a day and we'd get to a spot and they're like, what do we do next? I'm like, God, God hasn't shown me that part yet. <laughs> and so I would like, we'll just start on it next week. And uh, it, it's just, it's been amazing to see it grow. And we actually took it somewhere yesterday and to see the kids get on it and see, uh, um, it's just, you know, it's, it's all God. And, uh, um, I'm just excited. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, Carla, uh, if somebody is listening to this today and they want to learn more, they want to partner up with you, what, what are some opportunities and how can they do that? So we will have Hope Dealers in the atrium, so please go up and visit them. We need um, people that are willing to go to the hotels. We also have a new ministry starting called Breaking Bread Ministry. This is where we're taking meal kits to eight families in Beffert. The meal kits will have a meal, a recipe, and an activity. And the goal is that the family gets around the table and cooks and socializes and fellowships like Jesus. So we need volunteers for that as well. We also need people to help out with the skate ministry. If you have kids that wanna learn to skateboard, today at the Beffert Skate Park, 4 p.m., free, come out and do that. And of course, prayer is number one. So please just pray for us. I had someone today tell me that they prayed, been praying for us for a year. So we appreciate that. Um, you can go out at the atrium, hear more about us, and we would love to have you guys along. All right. Thanks, you guys. So Andrew, uh, tell us about these people that are with you. Actually, Steve promised to uh, go out and drop into the, uh, to the ramp. He's gonna put his vans on and drop into the skate ramp after, after service. Are there any paramedics in the audience? <laughs> uh, well, guys, this is uh, Isaiah 117 house. Um, this is Mary Prilliman. Mary's been a part of Blue Ridge for about 17 years, and Laura and Tony Erskine have been a part of Blue Ridge for about 12 years. And um, this dream and vision really originated with Mary. So Mary, tell us, what is Isaiah 117 house? Um, well, when kids come into foster care, I think people are under the assumption um, because they come from maybe a neglectful or abused situation that it is uh, a happy and good day for them. But it is actually the opposite. It is a traumatic and maybe even the worst day that they will um, come upon in their life because they will lose their parents, they will lose their home, their toys, their pets, their friends, their school, and sometimes even their siblings. And um, a lot of time on removal day, the police are involved, the adults are upset, everyone is um, kind of in an uproar. And these children come into care feeling like it is their fault and they've done something wrong. Um, and they're usually taken most times to the Department of Social Services offices to sit until the social worker can find a foster placement for them. What the Isaiah 117 house is going to do is it will be a house where the social worker can bring the child instead of to the office, and that child can be met by volunteers and be lavishly loved on. And like our shirts say, love you're not alone. They'll know that they're not alone on that, that day and um, our goal is to make that day just a little bit better. They can get clean clothes, um, a shower, a bath. The social workers will have an office that they can work out of. 
um, and have privacy so the kids won't have to overhear what's going on. And then um, when they find placement, uh, they will leave the home uh, with a duffel bag. A lot of kids come into care with trash bags, uh, but they will leave with a duffel bag with um, at least uh, three days of clothes and items and everything that they need for those days, which helps the foster parents on the other end. They don't have to run to the store to be uh, getting the supplies that they need. They can just focus on the child and transition them into their home um, better. So we're really excited about um, the possibilities. Yeah, and so you were, Mary was on staff uh, here at Blue Ridge. We worked together for quite a while and you left staff to follow this dream. But how, how did this originate for you? What kicked this off for you? Sure. Well, about um, five years ago, I stepped into the um, system of social services and foster care when um, some relatives of m my children came into care and I started a foster care journey and then adoption. Um, and in that, I saw a system that was really broken. I saw people that were hurting on all ends from bio parents to social workers to it. it there's a lot and I was so burdened by what can we do to help? Like, we need to help. We got to do something. And I really felt like God was calling me out of this building to serve somewhere. And I, I felt a calling to that, but just didn't really know what that would look like for me. I had a lot of ideas, because I'm an idea person. I had an idea to create a daycare. And I, like these guys, I'm like, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. So um, anyway, the pandemic sort of hurt hit and we were all watching our phones and Facebook videos and I saw Mike Rowe had a Facebook show called Return the Favor and um, the Isaiah 117 house was um, featured on that one of the shows and uh, which originated about less than three years ago with a woman named Rhonda Paulson in Tennessee and um, when she found out that the kids came and sometimes even spend the night in the DSS office, God really called her to come up with an idea. And this was her idea. And it just hit me that this simple thing would reach and help so many problems in care. And so I was really excited about the video and I sent it to um, these folks here. And then, um, Dana and Tyler, who are in Bedford, you can go out and say hi to them. Um, so I sent it to them, and then crickets, nothing. They didn't say, I said, I really wanna do this, sent the video. And um, so about a week went by, and I was like, hey, did you watch the video? And they were like, oh, not yet, not yet. So um, Tyler and Dana said, I'll watch the video right now. And um, they watched it. And it was about 17 minutes long, and I got a call 17 minutes later, and Tyler was saying, we're in it with you. What do we need to do? And that's where our journey began. And by the way, so again, this is, I would encourage you guys, go on Facebook, you can search it. Um, Mike Rowe, Return the Favor, or you can just uh, search Mike Rowe, Isaiah 117. It is absolutely worth your 20 minutes. It gives a little more behind the story about how the, Rhonda Paulson had a dream from God and it's kind of trickled out. So uh, uh, Mary, it originated with you and then you guys, how, how, did, how does this look for you to get involved? Yeah, but we have known Mary for 12, 13 years. I've um, been in ministry together um, and we're really close. And then Tony and I um, were a part of a sibling group placement with Dana and Tyler who are in Bedford and Mary. And um, that brought us even closer together. So. Tony and I have been foster parents for over 10 years, had multiple placements in our home, and you know, go figure, Department of Social Services is like, you can only have so many kids in your house. <laughs> and so we um, decided, uh, you know, we kinda need to put a hold on that. And when Mary presented this idea to us, um, we, it really resonated with Tony and I because doing foster care, we said yes to not only having children in our home, but we were willing to do the late night phone calls and take children in the middle of the night. Um, we, you know, they have children sometimes sitting on the side of the road with a police officer. 
willing to take them that immediately. And so just being on that side of it and realizing what a huge need it is for a child to have a spot where they can go and have some rest and have some peace and be loved on before they are taken to a home with a family that they don't know um, and they're able to have some dignity and get a bath and get cleaned up. And so um, Mary wanted to do this and we love Mary and so we said, all right, we're in it too. And you know, one, of the, one of the things, as we were talking a couple weeks ago, it, <clears throat> Tony said something that reminded me of a mentor of mine that I had in college. He said, um, I'm here to teach you, uh, I, I'm here to encourage you towards Christ. And maybe along the way, you'll learn some business policy. That was his mindset. And uh, Tony was talking about you know, Isaiah 117, the passage of caring for the orphan um, and making disciples. And ha- so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, It's so important for all of us, um, not just us at the Isaiah 117 house, but also us at Blue Ridge, um, to keep in mind that Isaiah 117, the passage, came way before Isaiah 117 house, the ministry. And it is way more important for us to answer that call, to learn to do right, to seek justice, to defend the oppressed, to take up the cause of the fatherless and to plead the case of the widow, right? We are just doing a small part of that. And our prayer today is that, and, and for everybody who serves, that, that's, that's where our heart really is, is for this to be a place where people can um, start to realize their calling or if they're not sure of what, what is my calling. Well, you know, what he said a couple of weeks ago, you, you can't, it's hard to steer a parked car, right? And so for this to be a place where people can start to serve and to start to say yes and to realize what God's true calling on their life is, and it will tie back to one of these callings in scripture, like Isaiah 117. Um, I think maybe one of the biggest things, because it, sometimes it feels like a guilt thing. Like, it, I think one of the biggest things is to, to look up here and you see a bunch of just plain old normal people. I'm a computer programmer, she's a housewife, Mary's disabled. I mean, we're just normal people, right? We, we have all our just normal challenges, but there is a, we're also joyful people, right? There is a joy on the other side of yes that if you're not saying yes, you are missing out on. And I just wanna invite you into that today. Not a guilt thing. This is an opportunity. And I, not just with us. I mean, maybe it's the shut-in widow that, that you drive by your house every day when you leave your neighborhood. But whatever it is, um, yeah, just say yes. Awesome, and um, you know, Woody spoke a couple weeks ago on following the cloud. Uh, Harley alluded, alluded to it about you know, building this thing and not sure what to do next. And so as you guys are walking through this, it's about a year and a half old. The dream and vision is about a year and a half old for you guys. Um, where are you at currently? Well, currently we just had our kickoff, kickoff in March. Um, and so we're in the awareness phase. But, um, you know, we don't have a physical house yet, but we're not waiting um, for a house to serve and to love on these kids. We've partnered with the um, uh, Child Protective Services. They call us when they have a removal. We are serving the children right now that are being removed. Um, We have a storage area. We've had actually people in this church who have done clothing drives and you know we're looking to do diaper drives and build up this resource room that we can serve um, the kids as they come into care and the foster uh, families. Um, so we're doing that and um, we have a lemonade stand challenge, lots of things going on um, as far as serving. Um, and one thing that we're really, um, is prayer. Like Carla said, we believe in the power of prayer. So us as a, uh, a community, um, as the Isaiah 117 community, we set our alarms at 117. I even have them go off in the middle of meetings and I just say, ha, ah, let's stop and pray. Gives me an opportunity to talk about what we're doing. Um, but we set our alarms for 117 every day and pray for Isaiah 117, the houses, the missions, um, our yeses, where we're going and what we're doing. We'd love for you to partner um, with us in that. Yeah, if you feel like this may be lining up with a dream or vision that God is, is stirring up in you, that would be 
a next step is to pray at 117. Um, what would be another way to get involved with you guys? Yeah, well, I guess above all else, there's so many things to kind of list off, but this is not our story. This isn't, I mean, this is what God has given us to do. And so I know so many of you out there have so many talents and gifts and God is calling you to the next yes. And so maybe it's here with us or maybe it's not, but we welcome your creative ideas. Um, we certainly would, would want to hear them out in the atrium and would love to talk to you. Awesome, Tony. Yeah, and especially when it, we're talking about creative ideas, one of the ones that came out of, um, out of Tennessee was a mom who wanted to, you know, her kids wanted to figure out how can we help the Isaiah 117 house. And so they had the idea of uh, doing a lemonade stand and sending all the money to uh, the Isaiah 117 house. And so that kind of became a thing. In fact, if you, on your way out, if you want, you can grab, there's packets and they have all the information about how do you partner with the Isaiah 117 house by putting up a lemonade stand in your front yard. And uh, so that, I mean, there's so many other ways. I mean, we're building, renovating house. There's a ton of different things uh, that we could, so just come see us. Um, but I really want to, I just don't, it's so easy to breeze right past. I mean, Carla said, pray. Mary said, pray. Guys, there is nothing more important that we can do than pray. Because serving with one of these ministries may not be your next yes, right? But I guarantee you that God has called every single Christ follower to obey and to live out Isaiah 117, right? And what that looks like, only God can tell you. I can't tell you what that looks like. So really, set your alarm. Take read that passage and set, pray and ask God, what does this mean for me? Awesome. Thank, hey, thanks so much for being willing to share, your, take us on the journey that God's taking you on. We appreciate that. Yeah. All right, so what is next? If you are a follower of Jesus, then he has given us a call. And that call we've been speaking a lot about, it is to go and make disciples. So if you say, I am a follower of Jesus, then his call on your life, it's a non-negotiable, is to go and make disciples. That's, that's the function. The form may look different. Maybe God's not calling you to start a nonprofit. But if you're a follower of Jesus, he is calling you to go and make disciples. So I'm gonna give some categories this morning, and I'm gonna ask you, if you fall into one of these categories, I'm gonna ask you to respond. And the way I want you to respond this morning is simply by standing. And so we'll, I'm gonna go through all four categories, stay standing the whole time. So the first category is, if God has been speaking to you this morning as you've listened to these individuals talking about Isaiah 117 or anxious for nothing, if God is stirring in you to at least go have a conversation or to pray or to ask them, how can I partner up with you? I would like you to stand right now in here, in Bedford, even online. If you are in your house, stand up because you're saying yes. That is awesome. So stay standing. So. What about you? Maybe God is stirring something in you and it has nothing to do with one of these ministries, but you have been asking God for a vision and a dream and he has been crystallizing that for you. And you're feeling that tug that God is saying, this is the thing I want you to step into. If that's you, I want you to stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bedford, stand. If you're at home, stand. And so maybe you already have a, a ministry. Maybe you're already responding to that dream or that vision that God has called you to, and we could easily have you up here. Would you stand if you've already responded to that dream and you're leaning into it? I want you to stand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And finally, maybe you know that God is calling you to make 
disciples, and you want to be obedient to his call in your life, but you don't know. He hasn't given you that dream or that vision yet, but you want to be obedient. Would you stand? Amen. Amen. God is so very good to us. Guess what? It doesn't depend on you. It doesn't. If you think this is all on me, it's not on you. It's on him. What's on you is your response to what he's calling you to do. It's about obedience and taking that next step. So Andrew and I are going to stand with you, and we're just going to pray over you this morning. So, Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for the movement of your spirit that you are making something new in your church. Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you that there are dreams and visions that are starting to come to life. There are those that are taking off and those that they're waiting for you to respond to their call as they're asking you, show me. And so I pray for those who don't know that maybe their call, Father, is just to partner up with somebody else. So would you bring people together according to your perfect plan and your perfect will. We know that as a church that you've called us to go, to go and make disciples. And my prayer for us is that when we come back on Sundays in the future, that we will be celebrating and telling, telling stories and worshiping you and praising your name because of the things that you're doing between Monday and Saturday. And so Father, we thank you for the people that are standing. And I pray your blessing and your spirit's power on them this morning. Father, I'm grateful for your goodness to us as a church and for the ways that you're leading us as a church. Um, Father, again, coming back to Acts 2, that you would pour out your spirit on us, that you would give us the dreams and visions. The thing that I love, Jesus, you said the harvest is great, but the workers are few. That there is so much work to be done that you know, not any one person can do it. And so would you give us the kinds of dreams and visions that would make us into the church uh, the kind of church where we are seeing disciples that are making disciples, that we are making a kingdom difference outside of these walls. I pray especially for the ones who are saying, you know, God, I want to follow you here. I want to be obedient, but I don't know what it is you have for me. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal that to them. I pray that you would show them clearly what a next step is. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Stay standing. You're going to like this song. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, yeah, we are going to sing a new song. We're singing a new song. Some of you guys might know, some of you might not know it, but this is our opportunity to give God praise for what he's done, for what he's doing, and at the same time, look the devil in the face and say, what do you have on this? What do you have on my God who has already defeated you? So if you can, join your voice in. If not, let's clap together. Let's raise our hands together in victory. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life there is no rival that could ever stand against your might you've always been with us every battle you've already won we've already won there is no weapon that has ever mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. Come on, in faith we say this. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't park. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in his kingdom, every death is.
Come on, let's get those hands together. Now all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Now all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance. God is so good. The Spirit of God is here with us. Today, there is a movement of God that He is sweeping through us, and He wants us to go and be the church into every nook and cranny of, the, of society and, and culture. We get to do this. We get to. I want to show you a posture of your next step. This, this may be your next step. Just get on your knees and lift up your hands and surrender to him. And say, Father, here am I. Send me. I know God is moving in you today. I know he is because he's, do, he's doing something here at Blue Ridge. Be obedient to his call. Go and make disciples. Step into the adventure that he has for you. He will blow your mind. We get to be part of this. Thank you so much for being here today. Now go and make disciples. Have a great day.